welcome to the podcast, Tis But a Scratch, Fact and Fiction About the Middle Ages. I'm your host, Professor Richard Abels, and today's episode is about Mongols, in particular about the Mongol impact upon the medieval Near East. We're very fortunate to have as our guest the leading expert on this subject, Dr. Nicholas Morton, Associate Professor in History at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. Nick is the author of four books, Encountering Islam on the First Crusade, Cambridge University Press, 2016, The Field of Blood, The Battle for Aleppo and the Remaking of the Medieval Middle East, Basic Books, 2018, The Crusader States and Their Neighbors, A Military History, Oxford University Press, 2020, and most recently, The Mongol Storm, Making and Breaking Empires in the Medieval Near East, Basic Books, 2022. Welcome, Nick. I'm so glad you could join us. Thank you. I have a lot of questions to ask, so let's just get started. Ready when you are. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get cracking. I'm sure that our listeners have all heard about Mongols, and they've heard about the devastation of the Mongols. The title of your book, The Mongol Storm, really resonates with our listeners, but they probably don't know very much about who they were historically. So who were the Mongols? Sure. Well, I think one of the best ways to explain this is that across much of Central Asia, there, it's, a, it's a very vari- varied landscape. You've got mountains and forests, just as you do anywhere else, but you've also got huge areas of grassland. And those areas are extremely suitable for nomadic peoples with large herds of sheep and goats and horses and other animals. And these people move from grazing ground to grazing ground, often from spring to winter grazing grounds. And often they'll do that in peace. And throughout history, you've had the names of various peoples who have conducted a nomadic way of life in those various areas. And the Mongols are one such group. One such group, it's towards the eastern end of that huge area, that huge grass sea, as it's sometimes known in Central Asia, um, in the region around, not direct, sort of around the area of modern Mongolia. And as with many of these nomadic peoples, from time to time, they form, they form confederations. And those confederations can then attack the various societies around their perimeter. That's why you have the Great Wall of China to keep um, to keep really the proved, nomadic peoples out, yeah. Really um, proved effective. <laughs> and uh, and then with the Muslim world, you've got a series of big fortress cities, uh, often most of them along the line of the Oxus River. And then in Western Christendom, which had also suffered nomadic attack, or before that, the Roman Empire, whether from people like the Avars or the Huns or people like that. And the Hungarians or Magyars in the ninth century as well. Indeed. Uh, you have the thick area of deciduous woodland, which often proved very difficult to penetrate for nomadic people. So this is a sort of a much bigger Eurasian story. And the Mongols are one such people, and they form a crucial part because they were in many ways the most effective of these nomadic confederations that was to emerge and then conquer the various societies around their, their periphery. Were the Mongols a single people, or are we talking about a linguistic group or... What exactly were they? Were were they a confederation of different groups? They started off as a single group, but what's interesting about the Mongol identity is that as the Mongols began to um, conquer or defeat neighbouring peoples, they began to draw them in to the Mongol people and they and essentially making them Mongols. So the idea of being a Mongol became a much broader identity. And even later on in the Mongols' conquests, in some cases, the Mongols might defeat an empire, a society, sometimes not even just nomadic ones, but potentially even agricultural ones too, and then enroll some of the um, defeated warriors into their own ramp- ranks. So it became a sort of much broader identity rather than being a specifically defined sort of name for a group of people. In other words, a cultural rather than a genetic or ethnic identity. Indeed. And such people who were involved, they weren't necessarily allowed to choose whether they wanted to be enrolled in the Mongol people. This was often yeah. done by force. And once you had been enrolled, you were expected to cut your hair in the Mongol fashion and to wear Mongol clothing and a Mongol hat and to conduct yourself like other Mongol 
uh, Mongol warriors. And there's a famous regulation which um, had it that if someone should try and flee from battle, perhaps someone who'd been forcibly recruited into the Mongol army, if you fled from battle, the rest of your squad would be killed. Wow. And so there is a very strong incentive, even if you have no desire at all to fight for the Mongols, you're still going to do it because you know if you don't, then the, your, your, the other members of your company will suffer. And if an entire company of 10 should flee, then they'll do so knowing that the um, the broader regiment of 100 soldiers will then be executed. Which ensures that your fellow soldiers will be monitoring you and making sure that you don't desert. Indeed. And they, they, they will want to make sure you don't flee because they know what's going to happen. As an Anglo-Saxon historian, this reminds me of the pre-conquest tithing in which you had 10 free men, all of whom were responsible for the good behavior of the others. And if one should break the laws, the others had to either produce him for justice or had to pay the fine in his place. But it's a lot more brutal than the tithing ever was. And it, it, it seems to have been tremendously um, effective, irrespective of the uh, the moral questions it raises. Yes. yes. So we have these nomadic people, and for centuries they're they're tending their herds. And then what? Late twelfth century, things change. Yeah. So a leader begins to emerge called Temujin, and Temujin he, he's not blessed with unbroken success. He has his fair share of defeats, but he keeps going. And eventually he manages, whether through military conquest or alliances, to put together a, a critical mass of soldiery, a critical mass of people, with which he is then able to start to wage war, not just on nomadic neighbours, but on much more powerful um, agricultural or semi-agricultural societies, perhaps most notably areas of northern, what's today in northern China. And Temujin in 1206 takes the title Chinggis Khan, which, of course, uh, he's, he's much more famous for, Genghis Khan, as it's, as it's yes. sometimes pronounced. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a long-term process, this welding together of peoples. And it's not, in fact, Temujin or Chinggis Khan who embarks on, who conducts most of the major offensives of the Mongol Empire. Chinggis Khan dies in 1227 while the Mongol Empire is still in the process of expansion. But he creates a model from which his sons and successors will then build to then bring about the conquest of the Mongol Empire across areas of China, the Near East, Western Eurasia, and even as far afield as distant and remote places like Western Christendom or parts of it. I know that the title Genghis Khan means in Mongolian universal leader, but was global conquest really Genghis Khan's goal? This is a, a source of academic debate. Opinions divided on this particular subject because some people feel that Chinggis Khan felt that he had a mandate to conquer the entire globe, all human civilization. And he felt he had that mandate very early on. And that mandate, as far as Chinggis Khan was concerned, he felt derived from the eternal heaven, Tengri. And he felt that he had received this mandate from Tengri to rule all human civilization. And therefore, that is the mainspring for his subsequent conquests. That's possible. It, Some yeah. people seem to feel that, in fact, that objective of planetary conquest, essentially, that only emerged later during the reign of his son, Ogadai. It's not quite clear whether it crystallized under Chinggis Khan or under Ogadai, but certainly by the time you get to Ogadai's reign, then certainly the Mongols believe that they are in the process of bringing about the total subjugation of all human civilization under their control. And that's it. That's, that's, that's the underlying uh, message. The great Khan Giyuk, a grandson of Chinggis Khan, made this crystal clear in a letter that he sent to Pope Innocent IV in 1247. The Pope had sent the Franciscan missionary, John Oplano Carpini, to the court of the great Khan in hope of converting him to Roman Christianity. The great Khan was not impressed, to say the least. In response to the Pope's rhetorical question, what crime had the Hungarians committed that justified the Mongols conquering their lands and those of other Christians, the great Khan replied, Chinggis Khan and the great Khan Ogadai 
have both transmitted the order of the eternal God. Uh, the letter is in Arabic, and the scribe apparently translated Tengri as Allah, as God. The order of the eternal God that all the world should be subordinated to the Mongols. But they disregarded God's order, and thus the eternal God himself has killed and exterminated the people in those countries. Through the power of God, all empires, from the rising of the sun to its setting, have been given to us, and we own them. How could anyone achieve this except by God's order? And of course, the fact that the Mongols go from victory to victory to victory will only serve to embed them in that belief because, of course, well, they're winning, so they must be, must be doing something right. This sounds similar to the ideology of the early Islamic expansion, as the caliphate enjoyed pretty much unbroken military success until a year-long siege of Constantinople in 717 to 718 failed, and the Saracen army was defeated at Tours by the Frankish leader Charles Martel in 732. The conquests of Persia and the Byzantine Near East played into the idea that the mission of the caliphs was to bring the entire world under submission to the will of God. It's difficult in this secular age to appreciate how culturally ingrained the idea was in the early Middle Ages and the High Middle Ages that victory on the battlefield and defeat on the battlefield reflected the will of God. The Mongols weren't unique in this. I think certainly it needs to be taken very seriously that once a, a civilization has got hold of the idea that it has a right to rule, neighboring areas the world whatever yes. once they feel that is a divine mandate and once they feel they've received confirmation of that generally by means of repeated military victories and of course the more you win more the win you more the you tend to go on winning because your troops become more experienced and more confident and yes. your enemies start backing away even before they've started fighting once you've got that kind of environment going that can be a very powerful driver for just simply ongoing success that just builds and builds and builds Maybe uh, at this point, just a few words about Mongol religion. It's a shamanistic sure. religion. Is it monotheistic? It's complicated. Um, <laughs> I love that. That's that's the perfect academic answer. Yeah, it is. It's not a very helpful one, I'm afraid. But <laughs> the Mongols believed in Tengri, the eternal sky or the eternal heaven. Now, that's not a synonym for God, necessarily. It's not God in sort of, I don't know. The, 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 conven the, the conventional Western European sense, you might say. But it is the perception that in, in the sky there is this, this spiritual force that has given the Mongols this very specific mandate. So that is obviously a key element of the Mongols' beliefs. But you're right. The, the Mongol society itself, it has all sorts of spiritual taboos. And perhaps the easiest way to explain this is it's, it's a little bit like a sort of a landscape really in that it's perceived that the landscape and the various elements of it they have spiritual forms and qualities so the river and running water has a spiritual quality to it and that there are certain um spiritual entities or um spiritual beings that live in certain hills or mountains or crags and so the landscape is imbued with a very strong spiritual resonance and that makes some areas um, very desirable some areas an area of fear but, but it, it's a spiritual way of looking at the world around you. And linked to this, there are all sorts of taboos, things to do, things not to do, so as to appease the right spiritual forces or the right spiritual beings, and so as, so as not to incur the wrath of those that you don't want to upset. So it's, it's a complex spiritual world. But one of the most interesting dimensions to the Mongols' um, religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs is that they accepted the presence of other religions. They accepted that other religions had potentially religious power, spiritual force, and were therefore true as far as they went, but that they were all subsumed within the broader Mongol mission and right to rule the world. And that creates a very interesting environment because the Mongols, they're, they're, they're sometimes described as practicing a form of religious tolerance. Yeah. And sometimes they're, they're praised to the skies for this as sort of the forebears of tolerance as it might be understood in the modern day. I, I don't go quite that far. What the Mongols seem to have wanted from the various other religions and religious groups under their control 
is they wanted the religious leaders of those religions to channel their spiritual power as their as as it's understood for the betterment of the Mongol Empire, its expansion, the health and long life of its leaders and its victory in battle. So in many ways, religions are seen as sort of resources to be used. They're not deemed to be false or wrong. Conversion's not really a thing in quite the same way, but they are nonetheless assets that the Mongol Empire wants to um, channel towards their own greater goals. And certainly they see their own religious mandate as encompassing those of all other religions. There's an interesting analogy here to the way that the Romans looked at other religions in the creation of their empire. They accepted the existence of foreign gods, which is a lot less of a problem if you're a pagan than if you're a monotheist. And rather than impose their gods upon conquered enemies, they appropriated those deities and integrated them into their own pantheon. Yeah. This is underscored by the so-called filial law, or rerum repetitio, the ritual by which the Romans declared war. The underlying theological concept was that the gods are just and in disputes will support those with just cause. Before the Romans went to war, they sent a priest to the border of enemy territory. There the priest would announce to the gods the injuries that the enemy had committed against Rome and demand just restitution. The filial priest would then cross into enemy territory and make the same announcement to the first person encountered and then to the first magistrate he encountered. If restitution was not made within 33 days, the priest would return to the border and throw across it a javelin whose tip had been dipped in blood while calling upon the Roman gods, though conspicuously not Mars, and the enemy gods to recognize the justice of Rome's declaration of war and support them in the conflict. And it's not cynical. It's an acceptance of spirit of a spiritual world in which the moral superiority of the Roman cause would be recognized and supported by the deities. Of course, the Jews of Judea, as monotheists, who knew that their god was the only god, had some difficulties with this, and that led to a couple of unsuccessful rebellions. I'm sure that the Mongols found some difficulty dealing with Christians and Muslims for the same reason. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting comparison. It, it, it was also tremendously frustrating, for particularly for a Franciscan or Dominican missionaries yes. from Western Christendom, because they would go to the Mongol Empire and start preaching. And the Mongols would listen to them. And and you, you, there's a, a guy called William of Rubruck who wrote about this. And he said, well, when I tried to explain all these things to them, they said, well, it's it's simple. We're we're Mongols and you're Christians. So we believe in Mongol religion. You believe in the Christian religion. And that's it. <laughs> and, and so the missionaries made, had, had to virtually no purchase hold on that at all. So it's I think what makes it so fascinating, what makes this whole subject so fascinating is that coming in, I suppose, from a Western European perspective, you're engaging with a society that has a very different way of viewing the world, viewing the ordering and life of a human being. And it's fascinating just to, to see how these collisions of different mentalities, different viewpoints, whether it's uh, Muslim or Buddhist or Christian travellers to the Mongol Empire, what they made of the Mongols. And in many cases, the areas where they simply don't understand each other, or they're trying to trying to understand each other, but trying to grapple with the fact that their frame of reference is so very different. It, 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 that, that, I always find that very fascinating. I can understand the frustration of Franciscan missionaries. The Mongol religion might well have seemed to them to be a form of monotheism, with Tangri being the Mongol name for God. So if they could only find the right way to explain Christianity, they could convert the Mongols to the true God. If you just simply explain it well enough to them, uh, it just doesn't work. Yeah, that, that would certainly be what the missionaries would, were, were hoping at the time. But um, it, there, there is some interesting permutations of this. So we hear, for example, of a, an Armenian Christian monk from the Jerusalem area who went to visit the Mongols. and. He's, he's, he, he, tr he tried to begin to sort of weave in Christianity into the Mongols' own religious beliefs and try to sort of present Christianity as if it's 
it's in the somehow it's it's compatible and it's linked to the Mongols' own beliefs. And there's lots of people trying this at, during this era. You've got advocates from various religions. They've understood the Mongols are winning in, yes. in which any sense of the word, given the expansion of their empire. So the Mongols can't be defeated on the battlefield. And so what they try and do is to work their own beliefs, work their own theologies into the Mongol theologies as a way then as a bridge to try and draw the Mongols um, either to view their religion favorably or even better if you can manage it to convert them to whichever religion they're trying to yes. advocate for. Yes. So we have a nomadic people and this nomadic people becomes a Eurasian military force. What made the Mongols so successful militarily? Sure. Um, there's a lot of a lot of factors here. Nomadic peoples from the Central Asian steppe have got lots of traditional advantages anyway. So a society that is where children are born and raised to ride and shoot and conduct mass large scale hunts. Mm. Uh, these are all qualities with military applications. The fact that the Mongol Empire, like so many nomadic peoples, um, the fact that it, it's accustomed to moving from one area to another on block bringing all your resources with you and being quite spart spartan and hardy about how you bring that about. So you don't need that much food. You're not weighed down with luxuries or ridiculous things that I don't know, agricultural societies might bring along. There's no sort of huge sort of wealth or furniture or even an sort of animals being brought with you, except those which you need. So all of that makes for a very effective vehicle for conquest anyway. And that's before we start engaging with the Mongols' specific strengths in addition to those. Those are the underlying ones. But there are many more things. I've mentioned one already, which is the Mongols' ability to incorporate defeated opponents into their own ranks. And they're very adept at breaking up the various peoples or civilizations or societies that they've conquered and then enrolling them or forcibly incorporating them into their own ranks. So with every victory, they grow in number, all of which is very powerful. They're also very effective learners. They want to know better. They want to build up their skills. They want to um, address any deficiencies in their warcraft so they can get stronger and stronger. And so early on, the Mongols identify that they need to be better at siege craft. And so they begin to recruit during their campaigns in northern China, various Chinese siege engineers who they then use to create weapons for them in other conquests in other parts of the world. Another major thing. Their commanders also have a real knack for stratagems, for coming up with specific tactics to break down the doors of various civilizations. And so one of the earliest conquests in the Near East took place between 1220 and 1221 when two commanders called Jebi and Subutai um, travelled south of the Caspian Sea and up to the Caucasus. And in that process, they conquered Greater Armenia and Georgia. So they won many victories against armies in that region. And one of the ways they did it was to bear a cross in front of their army as they staged that invasion. Now, it seemed very likely that was a strategy. We don't know that for certain, but it certainly had the effect of persuading the army sort of formed up to see who this people was they thought they were about to meet allies and they continue to think that run up until the mongols broke into a charge and so there are all sorts of stratagems like this you hear about the use of fake warriors so so model warriors on model horseback on a hillside so the enemy orientates itself facing these um fake warriors only for the real attack to come from the side it's all sorts of things like that brilliant how does someone like Subutai become a commander? Was he from an aristocratic family? Did the Mongols, in fact, have a hereditary military aristocracy? Sure. Yes. I mean, anyone connected to the to the overall Mongol dynasty um, is has preferential treatment. They are they are de deemed to be uh, set apart from everyone else. But there there are commanders who do well. Rise from the ranks might be a slight a slight over exaggeration, but it's not just the the leading family that has a monopoly on military command, even if they do provide a large number of commanders. But a key factor which underpins the efficacy of many of these commanders is they're fighting so many campaigns and they're often winning. And so they're learning, they're building up confidence and experience as they go. They're adopting new techniques. They fought different opponents uh, in, on different battlefields and beaten all of them. So they've got a reasonable idea of how to do this. And of course, with every victory, 
their soldiers will be picking up better quality equipment, better quality horses, and will continue to do so as long as they continue to win battles. And an another stratagem, for example, that's used in the early phases of the Mongol invasion into the Khwarazmian Empire, that's an empire centred in Persia, but which also controls various surrounding territories as well. And with the conquest of each city, the Mongols would gather together a levy from the conquered city and then drive that le levy onto the next city and then force that levy to be in the first wave of the assault on the next city. So the defenders of that next city will experience that first wave of assault. They'll fire all their crossbow bolts, shoot all their arrows, they'll release all their catapult ammunition and utterly destroy that first wave, at which point the Mongols then begin their real attack. What British armies in the 17th through 19th centuries called the Forlorn Hope and the French called the Enfants Perdu, the Lost Children, though I doubt that the Mongols were as generous to the survivors of these assaults as the British and French would later be. Maybe a better term for them would be cannon fodder. Sure, yes. Actually, the 13th century English Benedictine monk Matthew Paris took note of this particular tactic. In the entry for 1241 in his Chronica Maior, his greater chronicle, Matthew Paris wrote, quote, And if by chance they spared anyone who begged them, they compelled them like the lowest of slaves to fight in front of them against their own people. If they pretended to fight or perhaps secretly warned them so that they might flee, these Tartars who followed in their rear killed them. If they fought bravely and conquered, they gained no thanks as a reward, and so they used up their captives as if they were beasts of burden. What most struck 13th century Western Europeans about the Mongols was their brutality. Matthew Paris famously or notoriously described them as demonic beasts, quote, So what mortal joys might not continue and the delights of the world might no longer be enjoyed without mourning. In this very year, 1241, a detestable satanic people, namely an immense army of Tartars, burst out from their mountain-encircled land, which had been made fast with an impassable mass of rocks, escaping like demons released from Tartarus, so they are well called Tartars, as if they were inhabitants of Tartarus, that's hell, they swarmed out and like locusts overwhelmed the face of the earth. They devastated the lands of the east with dreadful destruction, laying waste with fire and carnage, traveling through the lands of the Saracens. They leveled cities, cut down forests, tore down fortresses, ripped up vineyards, destroyed agricultural fields, and massacred city dwellers and rural folk. For the men are inhuman and bestial. They should be called monsters rather than human beings thirsting after and drinking blood, tearing apart and devouring the corpses of dogs and humans. They are clothed in the skins of bulls, are armed with iron lances, short in stature, stocky and compact in body, vigorously strong, invincible in war, untiring in labor. As a delicacy, they drink blood flowing from their cattle. Devoid of human laws, they have no knowledge of clemency. They are more ferocious than lions and bears. They have swords and daggers with one cutting edge. They are marvelous archers, not sparing sex, age, or rank. A gifted artist, Matthew Paris, illustrated his text with a picture of a Tartar feast featuring people roasted on spits. Matthew Paris got all of this secondhand, but his contemporary, the Italian Franciscan, the aforementioned John of Plano Carpini, who traveled among the Mongols, was just as appalled and even more conscious of the danger posed by the Mongols. In the wake of the Mongol invasion of Poland and Hungary, Pope Innocent IV sent the 65-year-old Franciscan on a mission to the Great Khan with the goal of converting him to the Roman Catholic religion. Carpini traveled all the way to Mongolia, meeting with the great Khan Givayok at his imperial camp near Karakorum. Unsurprisingly, the great Khan refused to convert and ordered Carpini to command the Pope and other Christian leaders to come before him and submit to his rule. When Carpini wrote about his visit to the Mongols, he depicted them as brutal, uncivilized, and untrustworthy. He wrote that, quote, killing other people was like nothing to them, and warned his readers 
that they represented an imminent threat to the Church of God. Warfare in Christendom in the High and Late Middle Ages was brutal. The main military activities were pillaging and sieges. Chivalry, to an extent, protected the knights, at least from other knights, but it didn't extend to the lower classes, and the civilian population of a town taken by storm was liable to be slaughtered. Nonetheless, the warfare practiced by the Mongols struck both Christian and Muslim medieval writers as being particularly horrific. I can't help wonder whether the Mongols consciously used terror as a tactic to persuade enemies that resistance was not only futile, but would result in their extermination, and that it was better to surrender than to fight. It's a, it's a common factor of armies of this era that they want to be seen as fearsome. And, I mean, just, just to, a slight digression, the Crusaders would fire decapitated heads over the walls of opposing towns and cities. Yeah. yeah. The First Crusade began with the Crusaders catapulting the decapitated heads of dead Turks into Nicaea. A year later, during the siege of Antioch, Crusaders are said to have gathered together 500 Muslim heads. They impaled 300 of them on stakes in front of the city to demoralize the defenders and toss the other 200 into Antioch. Or the Seljuk Turks, they would surround their opponents and when their opponents woke up in the morning, they would start hammering great drums to create an aura of disquiet and unease. And again, head taking or scalp taking, it's common for many peoples in the Near East. Yeah. Muslim head taking in the aftermath of the battle is at the heart of an anecdote told by the 12th century Arab warrior poet Usama Munkid. Selective snippets from Usama Munkid's memoirs are often used in medieval and world civilization classes to contrast the sophistication of the Muslim Near East to the barbarism of the Western Crusaders. One anecdote that is not used is how Usama and his companions were taking heads as trophies after they ambushed a contingent of Franks. One of the Muslim warriors, however, was so nearsighted that he mistakenly decapitated the corpse of his own brother to his lasting shame. Head-taking in itself, however, was quite acceptable. It's, I, I suspect that for many of these peoples, it is simply a military tool. They know that they've got a better chance of winning, a better chance of survival if their opponents are already worried before they start fighting. And the Mongols, in many ways, are the epitome of this. And the Mongols, as you say, they fully understood this. And so you have examples of entire urban centers being massacred, wide-scale raiding, wide-scale um, killings across many, many areas. And as victory builds on victory, as army after army fails to stop them, that will have a multiplier effect. You hear stories about how spears were erected in settlements where the Mongols had killed a thousand people. And so one spear would represent a thousand dead. And that certainly has a serious effect. And so you have these fears being expressed. Matthew Paris is a great example, but others can be found from other societies. It's not just Western Christendom yes. of people responding in this way. And so for some people, they begin to reach out for tales of the apocalypse to try and understand who the Mongols are. And there's a, a debate which you find in various manifestations, both in Christian and in Muslim cultures, about whether the Mongols are in some ways linked to the apocalyptic peoples of Gog and Magog, oh, who, as it says in the Bible, one day will emerge from the gates of the North, wreak havoc on, on all human civilization. And people aren't sure, is this what we're seeing here? Is this who the Mongols are? And the answer to that seems to be, in an astonishingly cross-cultural way, um, no, they're probably not Gog or Magog, but they might live nearby. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, they're not, and they're not pressed to John either. They're not pressed to John. Well, that's a different question, because, of course, there is a, a thought initially that maybe they are, at least in Western Christendom, may are, maybe they're, they're the legendary armies of Prester John arriving to save Christendom. But that... that, that out not to be the case. That doesn't last for very long, yeah. <laughs> so far, we've been emphasizing the success of the Mongols as they swept across Eurasia. But as you've described in your book, The Mongol Storm, the Mongols seem to have met their military match in the Mamluks of Egypt. Yeah. When the Mongols under 
Batu Khan and his general Sabatai invade central Europe in 1241. It appears, appears that the only thing that really turns them back is either the death of the great Khan uh, and the need to go back and elect a new one, or just simply the marshy nature of the Hungarian plain, which is just not suitable for the type of warfare that the Mongols conducted. But they weren't defeated by the Hungarians or by the Poles or or by the Germans. They won yeah. victory after victory. But when it comes to the Mamluks, there's a different story to be told. So maybe you should tell us a story about what happened in their invasions of the Near East. Sure, but you're, you're absolutely right. The Kingdom of Poland, Kingdom of Hungary, neither of them manages to stop the Mongols. Yeah, after his crushing defeat in the Battle of Mohi, King Bela IV of Hungary spent almost a year being chased from town to town in Dalmatia by a Mongol contingent intent upon capturing him. And, as you said, the Poles didn't do any better engaging the Mongols in that year. A crusading army is raised to try and defeat the Mongols in Western Christendom, but it never really makes contact. Um, and you're right as well, it, there is an ongoing debate as to what it is that caused the Mongols to ultimately back off. I don't think that whatever the reason um, for them backing off in 1241, I don't think that's the reason why they didn't ultimately take Western Christendom, because they were actually preparing for another massive offensive yes. 20 years later, uh, which never actually materialised. But the society that does defeat the Mongols is the Mamluks. They're not the first society to defeat the Mongols. There have been sporadic defeats encountered by the Mongol armies on various occasions previously, but no one's beaten them consistently. The normal pattern is that the Mongols may suffer a defeat one year, and then the following year, the massive Mongol counterattack utterly wipes out whoever it was who dared to defeat them the first time round. And so this, this is not something the Mongols are accustomed to. And, there, and yet there is Mamluk Egypt. So a bit of background, Mamluk Egypt is an empire that emerged in 1250. The Mamluks were originally enslaved people who had been enrolled or purchased and then enrolled and then trained in the Ayyubid army. That's the Ayyubid empire. That's the um, empire established by Saladin. Right. But in 1250, the Mamluks became too powerful and they overthrew their Ayyubid rulers and took control in Egypt. Yeah. At the same time that King Louis IX of France, that Saint Louis, was conducting his unsuccessful crusade in Egypt, in fact, the Mamluk coup d'etat took place as King Louis was negotiating the surrender of his army to the Ayyubid Sultan Turin Shah. Turin Shah had unwisely insulted the Egyptian-based Bari Mamluks by replacing their leaders with his own Syrian Mamluks. So the Bari Mamluks, led by Baibars, killed him, much to the confusion and distress of the French crusader and chronicler Juan Ville. Very true. And in fact, it's the defeat of Louis IX's army that seems to have gone some way to showing the Mamluks they did actually have quite a lot of strength in their own right. Yeah. And that may go some way to, show, to explaining why they staged their coup. But you have this Mamluk empire in Egypt. And when the Mongols begin a major offensive into the Near East in 1260, and this is two years after the horrific Mongol overthrow of the city of Baghdad. An event that shocked the Muslim world. As you describe in your book, the Mongol leader, Hulagu, ordered a systematic sack after the Caliph al mustasim unconditionally surrendered the city. Over the next few days, Mongols razed Baghdad's mosques and its great libraries and slaughtered its inhabitants, sparing only the city's Christians, because Hulagu's wife was a Christian, its merchants, and some members of the Shia community. In a letter to Louis IX, Hulagu claimed that he had put 200,000 people to the sword, though this may be an exaggeration. Historians estimate the death toll at about half that number, with many dying from disease in the overcrowded besieged city, whose water supply was polluted with dead bodies. But, as you point out, contemporary sources describe the gutters running red with blood. Hulgu's letter to King Louis is a good example of the Mongol use of terror to demoralize potential enemies. They advance across the Tigris and Euphrates River and then into northern Syria. Now, at this time, northern Syria is all that's left of the Ayyubid Empire, and it collapses almost without a fight. The Mongols take Aleppo in just a few days, and Damascus capitulates. And so at this point, 
there's really only two societies that are still independent, at least in that zone, in the sort of the Levantine zone. There's the Mamluks in Egypt, and then there's the Crusader states. Well, the Crusader states are not going to fight the Mongols. They're much too weak militarily, and they seem what they seem to try and do is to try and play a sort of mixed game of sending the Mongols gifts and trying to be nice to them without actually submitting to them. Yeah. Now, we'll never know if that would, that, that would actually have worked. It seems likely that it probably wouldn't have, because nonetheless, the Mamluks do something remarkable. The Mamluks march out from their borders and seek battle with the Mongols. And I really want to stress that point, because in the past, yeah, societies have put up a fight when the Mongols have invaded sometimes. But they've never marched out beyond their borders to fight the Mongols. So in some ways, they wrong foot the Mongols. Not, Mongols aren't expecting this. No one ever marches out to fight them. They wait to be attacked. And I suspect it's rather with that kind of thinking in mind that shortly after taking Aleppo, the leader of the Mongol army, the brother of the great Khan, called someone, someone called Hulagu, learns that his brother, the great Khan, has died and so withdraws eastwards. Um, it may not just be that the great Khan has died. It's possible it's also in search of grazing because he moved into what today would be the Caucasus and Azerbaijan, that sort of region where there's excellent grazing. So he may have gone for that reason, but he brings with him 90% of his troops and he leaves in the Near East only a fairly small garrison, perhaps no more than 10,000 troops, certainly no more than 20, to hold the area. And I expect he's not, that he, his thinking in that is that, well, no one ever marches out to attack yes. the Mongols. So he can, all he's got to do is put enough troops on the ground to hold the territory, maybe knock over a few castles, but that's it. Because no one's, no one's going to challenge the Mongols. That's never happened before. And yet the Mamluks do. Now, I don't think the Mamluks knew the Mongol army had withdrawn. So it's not as if they were sort of being extremely cunning about this. I think they were being extremely bold. They were marching with their army, which probably numbered much more than twelve to 15,000 troops against what was, as far as they were concerned, a full-scale Mongol invasion army, which may have numbered as much as 100,000 troops. And so they arrive outside Acre, the capital city of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which is the most powerful of the Crusader states. And they say, do you want to help us, effectively? And the Crusader states say, well, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> Obviously, I'm summarising here. Um, yeah. But they don't want to fight the Mongols. They realise that it's too dangerous and no one's ever defeated the Mongols. Why would they sign themselves up to that? But they also don't want to, loot to um, fall out of favour with the Mamluks either. So they give the Mamluks provisions, possibly also horses, and on the Mamluks go. And then the Mamluks meet the Mongol army in battle. And this is where we come to it. Why did the Mamluk army defeat the Mongols? Because even though the Mongols had just left a garrison behind, it's still at least as big as the Mamluk army. And it's difficult to say. Part of it is, goes, goes back to the fact the Mamluks themselves are actually very similar to the Mongols, because when the Ayyubids previously purchased all these warriors who they would then turn into Mamluks, the people that they purchased, the enslaved people, often from the Black Sea region, were often from Turkic nomadic communities who lived and fought in much the same way as the Mongols themselves. And the Mamluks encouraged, encouraged this, so they would train their warriors with the same traditional strengths that their peoples had always had, which are the same as the Mongols. Yes. The ability to ride, shoot, conduct large-scale hunts. So in some ways, they're fight fighting very similar forces. Some people have wondered whether the Mamluks' horses may have been better. Um, certainly, there's a, a strong tradition of rearing effective mounts in Egypt, often mixing Arab horses with the North African barb horse. That's what research has shown, not my own research, I'm afraid, but it's, uh, yeah. it's shown that, that, that the, the mixing of those two types of horse can produce very sturdy, powerful war horses. Perhaps that goes some way to explaining why they were so successful. And yet I can't help thinking that the Mongols, having conquered the better part of the Near East, would probably already have reserved for themselves whichever horses they wanted and therefore probably be equally as well mounted. So in many ways, when the Mongols and Mamluks fight one another, they're actually very similar in a number of ways. But that doesn't really answer the question of then why did the Mamluks defeat the Mongols? And it's, it is difficult to say. Various people have wondered if Mamluks were soldier for soldier more effective. That's a very difficult one to call. It may just have been down to the cut and thrust on the day itself and just how things worked out. Certainly one factor seems to be that at this battle, it's called the Battle of Ayn Jalut, an Ayyubid contingent, so a contingent from the former Ayyubid Empire that the Mongols had forced to go into battle with them, changed sides, 
mid-battle. And that seems to have had an effect. I can't help wondering as well if there's a, a degree of a sort of back against the wall type phenomenon yes. here. The Mamluks have nowhere else to go. So they're either going to have to win here or that's it. So you can never quite be sure what kind of effect that will have on their combat effectiveness and morale. Why don't they submit? I mean, the Seljuk Turks have already submitted, right? Yeah. The Caliphate has already submitted, well, or been destroyed. The most effective and scary empire in that region, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce this cor correctly, the Khorasmian yeah. Empire has been destroyed. Why don't the Mamluks just simply accept the uh, Mongol superiority? It's a good question. And it's a difficult one to answer. They don't tell us what we do know is that when the Mongols started their offensive, they sent ambassadors to Mamluk Egypt and to demand the Mamluks' submission. And the Mamluks could not have been more clear. They killed one and shaved the others in order to make the point. They yes. are going to resist. Of course, once that's been done, there, there can be no more talk of a diplomatic outcome from this. I don't know why I why they resisted so staunchly when, as you say, other civilizations hadn't. I mean, people like the Seljuk Turks, for example, they did put up a fight. They didn't just, just submit without any resistance, but they did ultimately submit once they had suffered battlefield defeat. It may be because the Mamluks were such a young empire. They're such a young society. They'd only been going for about 10 years because their rulers were ultimately in their origins at least, enslaved people. They weren't deemed to have much legitimacy by neighbouring powers. They may have felt that they wouldn't survive if they became a client state of oh, the Mongols. Therefore, they had to fight or they were going to go down one way or another anyway. What is the impact of this Mamluk victory at Anshalat? Is it really significant? Again, a historian's answer alert, um, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> It proves to be enormously significant, but it's complicated because as soon as Hulagu, who, as I mentioned, that's the brother of the former great Khan who yes. withdrew to Azerbaijan directly before the Battle of Ayn Jalut, when he learns his forces have been defeated, he makes it perfectly clear he wants to go straight back into the region and reassert his dominance and to crush the Mamluk Empire, yes. which would be the natural response given sort of the values at the time. That's just the way it's done. And the Mamluks knew this too. And so the counter strike is always the question hanging in the air. When are the Mongols going to come back? And it seems at this point that what helped the Mamluks is a number of other events and developments that they had no real impact on, which helped them enormously. The first one is that when Hulagu conquered much of the Near East or appropriated control over former areas under Mongol control in the Near East, he very much upset another branch of the Mongol Empire to the north, uh, centred in what today would be the region rather north of the Black Sea and to the north of the Crimea, as well as many surrounding um, territories. And so that rival dynasty, which at the time would become known as the Golden Horde, yes. it did not appreciate Hulugu taking control of the Near East, because as far as they were concerned, the Near East falls within their jurisdiction. They're all within the Mongol Empire, but it's a question of which um, branch of the imperial family has jurisdiction over a particular area. Right. Uh, an area known as an Ulu to, to, the, to these families at the time. And so when Hulugu conquers much of the Near East and takes control, they do not appreciate the fact that he has essentially usurped their claims. And so they march south in order to contest control. And so soon after Ayn Jalut, this the, the tensions between the two break into open warfare. And that warfare doesn't really go away. And that means that from that time onwards, there is what, effectively a second front for the Mongols in the Near East. They've got to watch the Mamluks on one side, but they've got to keep the bulk of their troops along the line of the Caucasus Mountains in case the Golden Horde comes south, or in case they want to push north. They're perfectly capable of being aggressive themselves. What does That's... the Great Khan think about all of this? Well, this is, this is the period, really, when the Mongol Empire is in the process of disaggregating itself. It's beginning to split up. It's, it's, it, this isn't the moment when the Mongol Empire collapses into into its various Lego bricks but it is in the it, it is in that process because you do have these imperial families that increasingly are asserting their individual family identity alongside that of the broader Mongol Empire they increasingly want a firmer control over the Ulu or territories 
within their jurisdiction and they are within the process of taking on the form of individual empires with the overall bracket of the Mongol Empire getting thinner and thinner and thinner as they rise up as powerful chunks within it. Okay, okay. Could you talk a little bit about the non-military impact that the Mongols had upon the medieval Near East? I think that for, again, most of the listeners, they hear Mongol and they think of warfare and they think of destruction. Yeah, it's the, the Mongols' legacy and their impact. It's pe- people, people spin this in various different ways. And you're right. The traditional view is that the Mongols, uh, their impact on the Near East was one of destruction. Well, they do, des- they do destroy Baghdad. They do. They destroy they Baghdad. Them. They sack many cities. They destroy many areas. And I don't in any way want to minimize the sheer loss of life and not just the loss of life, the dislocation of people as tens of thousands yes. flee west to get out of the way and the traumas of that and what that would have entailed. And even for those people who survived, even for those people who, who didn't have to flee, it's still going to have a profound effect on their on their life, their worldview, their sense of security and where they are. So we're talking about an enormous upheaval with a massive impact on the entire region. And for many, for many people, this would be that their invasions would lead di- directly to their deaths. Right. So I don't want to minimise that, but as you say, there is another side to the equation, because for a start, the Mongols have a rather different view of religion to many other of the religious communities in the Near East and elsewhere. And as I've mentioned, you know, the Mongols felt that their beliefs encompassed everyone else's, but they did accept other religions had a right to exist and practice their faith, provided they practiced them pointing at the Mongol Empire and its greater um, prosperity. And so it is a a form of tolerance. It's not tolerance for tolerance's sake, but it is a form of tolerance. And that changes the dynamics in the Near East, particularly for minority groups or subjugated groups across the region. Suddenly they're no longer subjugated. Yesterday's subjugator and subjugated are now equal within the Mongol Empire. And so that's an interesting development. A number of authors, notably Lila Abu Lagod, Timothy May, and most recently Marie Favreau, have credited the Mongol conquest with establishing a Pax Mangalica, the Mongol peace, similar to the earlier Pax Romana. This Mongol peace, it's argued, led to the creation of an integrated Eurasian trading network, arguably the first world trade system. I'm interested in your thoughts about that. The Mongols are also very keen on trade, and that goes right the way back to their historic origins. They've always had an interest in trade, and of course the Near East has a number of trade routes running through it, most famously the Silk Roads right. from Central Asia and China, and also the the, sort of the northern extension of the Spice Route across the northern Indian Ocean region. And the Mongols are interested in this, and they want to encourage the prosperity of these routes, because of course Uh, Every conqueror's favourite word is tax, and they want to make sure they get as much of it as they can, of course, like every any other conqueror. And so they do want to see economic flourishing following the extraordinarily brutal overthrow of these regions. Now, whether we should see this as a time of economic recovery or economic growth, economic growth seems a bit ambitious economic recovery, well, perhaps a little bit, um, but certainly they are keen on this and they do want the various communities under their control to practice their trades, continue to produce goods, which can then be shipped and taxed or uh, transported, transported by caravan. So, yeah, that is another dimension to it. Another... And they, they impose peace. There is a Mongol peace within the empire. Yes. Again, this is this is another one which this is another one which gets very heavily debated because in there are periods when the Mongols are not at war with each other, when it would be possible for a merchant to go from the western extension of the Mongol Empire all the way across to the Pacific coast. And the Mongols protect the trade routes to some degree as so they want that to happen. On the other hand, you also have examples of the Mongols fighting amongst themselves, such as the examples we've already given. Right. And there's quite a lot of rebellions to the Mongols' rule, particularly as the 13th century goes on. People do start to rebel. There's still reports of bandit activity. And so, again, historians have sort of, again, we come back to the awkward historian's answer of, well, yes or no. Yeah. I, I find 
I mean, there's various analyses put out there, but I've, I've always found the analysis persuasive that, yes, there were windows of opportunity to travel great distances in a way there hadn't been previously, but we shouldn't get too sort of starry-eyed about seeing this as an, as a, as a, an entire safe zone. There are still armies who crisscross it. There are still bandits and raiders and rebels who will make your life difficult if they can. The question of why, now this is a tricky one. There's various possible explanations. One of the stories to start with here, I think, is, and I'm going to focus on the Near East because that's the bit I've been, I've been focusing on. One of the stories that's best, the best to work with, it's got nothing to do with religion, but it's, it, it's to highlight a power dynamic. And that is that when Chinggis Khan overthrows one of the various um, peoples um, during his conquests, he managed to gain control over the, one of the leading women of that, of that people, and he then took her into his bed. Now, this must have been an enormously traumatic experience for her, that this conqueror, this person who's overthrown her family, is now demanding that she submit that, that she submit herself to him in this way. But she uses the opportunity that having gone to his bed and presumably had allowed him to have sex with her, or he's imposed that on her, she's then said, OK, I want to try and win your favour. I want to try and win further securities for my sister and ultimately for other members of my family and my people. So what's happened here is what, what I'm trying to flag up here is a power dynamic. She's realised she can't win, not on, a, not, not on the battlefield. Her people's defeated, it's gone. That, that opportunity is over. She now has to work within the Mongol system, accept the Mongols' demands and use that as a way of acquiring leverage. Yeah, and if that practice was continued by Chinggis Khan's 11 sons and his multitude of grandsons, that helps explain the remarkable finding published in the Journal of Human Genetics in 2003 that one in 200 males are direct descendants of Chinggis Khan. Indeed. But now what I'm going for here is just, that's just a, an example because what I think many people do is they do make the same deduction. You can't stop the Mongols, not in the battlefield, not really. And so there's no point trying to resist them. There's no point trying to rebel because the tyranny, tyranny is so great because you're just going to lose. Yes. And so as a result, people begin to besiege the Mongols, not besieging them with armies, but with goodwill. They send emissaries to the Mongols to try and say things like the Mongols, you had the right to rule, you were, you were rightful in your conquest of me and my people, your heroes, you're great. And so in a sense, these are, sort of, these are sort of charm offensives conducted towards the Mongols. And they know what they're doing. They yeah. want to win the Mongols' favour, because if you win the Mongols' favour and make yourself useful, then you can start to ask for things. Right. And once you start to ask for things, well, you might start off with um, sort of the basics, protection for your people, a privileged position for your community. These would all be deemed desirable. But ultimately, if you once you get really get into your ruler's good graces, well, perhaps you could it, perhaps you could influence them in other ways. Perhaps if you give them great titles or great spiritual stature in your own religion, that might give them a vested interest in taking on your beliefs. Perhaps if you make it clear that if they take on your spiritual beliefs, that might make it a little less likely for the people under your control to rebel against you as the Mongol Empire goes on. These are all the kinds of dynamics that are at work here. But we shouldn't exclude the spiritual dynamic too. And certainly the various sources that describe the Mongols' conversion, at least in the Near East, describe the Mongols being very much inspired by Sufi um, teachings, and uh, Sufi, Sufi Islam. And so that's another possible element to the equation. And another one may have been that the many in, in the Near East, the Mongols are not the first nomadic conquerors to reach the region. A little over a century before they arrived, the Seljuk Turks conquered the region. And the Seljuk Turks were very similar to the Mongols in a great many ways, including their basic culture and religious beliefs before the Seljuks converted to Islam in the 11th century. And uh, when the Mongols conquer the region, they often work with these various Turkic groups, sort of post-Seljuk groups and communities and rulers, across the area and often these are the people who get enrolled into the mongol army and so the argument has been made not by me but it's a persuasive one i think that because you have all these turkic communities in the near east that are being subsumed into the mongol empire and because these turkic groups are islamic 
but with a nomadic shamanistic background, that might provide a very powerful template for the Mongols to follow. Interesting. Really, really interesting. Well, we could talk about Mongols for hours, but we are running out of time. Is there something that we've left out in our discussion that you'd like our listeners to think about? There's a point I'd quite like to make, I think, which is one of the one of the things which it's, research is bringing out more and more, and it's right that it should. It's an important part of the Mongol legacy, and that is a question of mental horizons. And what I mean by that is that prior to the Mongol invasions, societies, whether that's the Ayyubid Empire or the Mamluk Empire or the Byzantine Empire or the Crusader States or Western Christendom or the Khwarazmian Empire or the Armenians or the Kingdom of Georgia and all the various territories that we've been discussing so far, they can see a fair way into um, Central Eurasia. They have some idea of what is out there, some better than others. And yet, in many many ways, in many cases, this is a sort of here be dragons region for all of them. They don't really know what's out there. They don't really know what you'd encounter if you set out. Like I said, some better than others, but nonetheless, there's a lot of grey zones where actually you don't know much of what's what's out there or what it involves. But with the rise of the Mongol Empire, you have suddenly have emissaries, missionaries, merchants, diplomats adventurers and the foolhardy in many cases, who can now suddenly set out over enormous distances to visit the Mongol the Mongol great Khan. People like people, Marco Polo. Like Marco Polo. Some people are forcibly uh, relocated um, because the Mongols often uproot, say, a group of textile workers from one region and then take them where they think they'll be of most value. And they do the same with intellectuals and scientists as well. And so suddenly people are traveling great distances and sometimes they return home with return home intact with both their body and mind still capable of working, which isn't always the case, but sometimes it does. And so I'll give an example of this. There's um, an English troublemaker who is thrown out of the kingdom of England. We don't know his name and we don't know exactly why he was thrown out. But we do know that he found his way one way or another to the kingdom of Jerusalem. And the capital of the kingdom of Jerusalem is the port city of Acre. And Acre is well known as being a hive of thieves and trouble. And because it's such a big commercial city, it's supposed to smell tremendously badly. And the sea is slick with slime because it's a big city without sewerage or without any ways of getting rid of its rubbish. And he finds his way into Acre. And it's disastrous for him. He gambles away what's left of his money. And so he is essentially broke. He's done. He's got nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. And so, like so many artisans and translators and professionals and mercenaries, he heads out to other territories in the Near East in search of employment. And this is by no means unusual. All sorts of professional people and warriors crisscross between Muslim, Eastern Christian and Frankish societies pursuing their trades that's totally normal and he's one of them and he finds his way into the mongol empire and it turns out he's got a facility with languages and he picks them up very quickly and so as a result he starts to learn these languages and becomes a translator and so his fortunes change suddenly he's no longer in rags he's now a respected individual working within the mongol empire and so when the mongols invade hungary he is one of their ambassadors so he has come back as the representative Um, of the very people trying to conquer, well, not the Kingdom of England, but Western Christendom ultimately as a whole. But he is taken prisoner. And so the the wheel turns and comes full circle. And eventually he finds his way all the way back to um, Western Christendom. But my point is that he's, he's returning, having gone through this astonishing career. But he returns with news of strange places people have never been to before. News of strange plants or animals. And so he suddenly, the knowledge horizon begins to push back. And I've given an example from Western Christendom, but this is equally true of Silesian Armenia, where the king of Silesian Armenia goes out to the Mongol court and comes back with reports of unfamiliar animals and, and places and cities. And the Mongols do this too. And we have examples of the Mongols testing their legends against the ambassadors they meet from faraway places because they want to see if that the legend is actually true. And so when the Mamluks send ambassadors to the Golden Horde in the 1260s, the Mongols say, oh, we've heard about Egypt. Isn't there an enormous bone 
that sits over the River Nile. It's so big you could actually walk across it. Uh, the Mamluks want to stay in favour with the Mongols, so they don't just sort of start laughing or something. They're very tactful. They said that they haven't personally seen it. But nonetheless, the knowledge horizon is being driven back, and suddenly the unknown is being replaced by the the known, or perhaps the sort of known in other in other areas. And I find that fascinating, that sense that all these societies are suddenly gaining a better or clearer appreciation of the world around them in a way they hadn't done previously. And the Mongols aren't doing this deliberately, but it's a side effect of what they do. Well, thank you very much. In fact, I'd like to end uh, by, by giving a plug for your most recent book, The Mongol Storm, Making and Breaking Empires in the Medieval Near East, published by Basic Books. And let me read a blurb from William, Ch William Chester Jordan, professor of history at Princeton University. This is the most exciting study of the Mongols and their encounters with the people of the Near East I have ever read. It is a story of epic proportions demanding much from a historian. Morton rises to the challenge. I find it extremely difficult to put this marvelous book down. And I agree. It's a great read and it's really informative. And it tells, it told me more about the complications of the political system in the Near East than I really ever appreciated before. So I really thank you for the book, for having written this book and for educating me. Well, that was very kind of you. It's also very kind of um, William Chester Jordan to be so generous, but uh, thank and, you. Well, thank you for joining us. Our next episode will be the long promised episode on King Alfred the Great. And I'll have as my co-host, my wife, Ellen. I hope you'll join us for it. If you are enjoying Tis But a Scratch fact and fiction about the Middle Ages, please spread the good news among your friends. Good ratings and good reviews will help others find the podcast. Bye for now. <laughs>